All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to 407. I am Matt Gibson, the Director of Undergraduate Programs at the Center for Entrepreneurship. Tom Frank, I think you know, is out of town today, so, uh, so we brought uh, the best in his absence. We have a very special guest today, and I'm very excited to be here with you. So just before we get going, a couple things you should be aware of, some Center for Entrepreneurship programs. First of all, if you are looking for some funding for launching your venture, we have the Jumpstart grants that are due this upcoming Sunday. So um, you can get money for prototyping, for legal help, or for customer discovery travel. Also, every year, you may be aware, but if not, you should be, we do a trip to San Francisco where we visit various entrepreneurial ventures and uh, get to be involved in that ecosystem out there. That's over spring break. The applications for that are due, I believe, December 4th. December 4th. And it is called the Woos Trip, the Weather Underground San Francisco Trek. And so I encourage you to apply for that. And then also, I know several people in this room have applied for the Entrepreneur's Leadership Program. We've gotten a lot of requests about that. And the announcement for that program is going out uh, later today for the uh, 20 students selected for that uh, Entrepreneurial Leaders Program. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our Dean, uh, Dean Munson, uh, to uh, present the rest of our program. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Munson, the Robert Blasick Dean of Engineering here at the university. Welcome uh, for this special installation of the Entrepreneurship Hour. Uh, today, we're presenting the James R. Meller Lecture. This lecture showcases an individual whose leadership has contributed to the public good, and its intent is to inspire the ideals of students and other members of our university community. It's made possible through a substantial endowment provided by Jim Meller, class of 1952 in engineering and also 1954, as well as Suzanne Meller, Jim's wife. And we thank uh, both Jim and Suzanne. Jim is with us here today. Today's Meller Lecture is co-hosted by the Center for Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship Hour, as we've already stated. I'm pleased that so many of our students could join us for this collaboratively presented event. Following our keynote speaker, we ask that you please remain with us for just brief comments from Jim Meller, and we'll then conclude with a reception uh, out in the atrium area of this uh, building. Our 2015 Distinguished Meller Lecturer is Mark Little. For 10 years, Mark has served as General Electric Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer. He leads one of the world's largest research and technology organizations. And as leader of GE Global Research, his responsibilities have spanned research facilities on four different continents. Mark holds bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from Tufts, Northeastern, and RPI universities. Uh, Mark keeps it simple. He says the fundamental purpose of an entrepreneur is to answer what's next. I think we're going to be hearing about that from Mark today. Please join me in welcoming the 2015 Meller lecturer, Mark Little. Dean Munson, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I have several things I want to say thank you for. The first is to all of you for coming here and spending time with me today. The second is to thank the university for giving me my first global experience. I came here back in 1981 and attended a five-week course where I got to go to China and learn a lot about the world. It was a really formative experience for me. But the most heartfelt thank you I have is for this university giving me a Boston sports fan, Tom Brady. Thank you very, very much for that. So I want to tell you a little bit about GE and what we do with innovation. We're quite serious about it. It's a big part of what we do. These are the GE industrial businesses. Each business in its own right is a global giant. They are very strong in the industries that they serve. They're, we spend about $5 billion on technology every year. That's about 5% of industrial revenues. That puts us in a world-class position in the industries in which we compete. If you went back five, maybe seven years ago, that level was about $2 billion or 2% of industrial revenues. 
So you can see the commitment to technology and innovation has gone up a lot. There are some 50,000 technologies across the GE network. The GE Global Research Team is a powerhouse in and of itself. The GE Global Research Center was the first industrial research laboratory formed in the United States back in 1900 out of the original formation of GE. There were two original sites, one in Schenectady, New York, and upstate, and one in Lynn, Massachusetts. And the founding fathers of GE decided that they needed to form an industrial research center to drive innovation, which has been from that point in time, and right certainly till now, the foundation of building a great industrial company. Since that time, we've been building out around the world. We spent the first 100 years focused in the United States, but we've gone to Bangalore, India, Shanghai, China, Munich, Germany, came back to this area, in fact, for an advanced manufacturing center near Detroit. We went to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil to build a customer-focused research center. We built a software center in San Ramon, California. We've got an outpost in Israel for innovation with that very high-tech part of the world. And we're, as we speak, building a center in Oklahoma in the heart and soul of the oil and gas country to build up our resources in that area. So we've got a very well-connected global network, customer-facing, GE businesses integrated, driving innovation across the world. This is how we think about ourselves. Our purpose is to improve the world by pushing the limits of science and technology for our customers. So you see improving, you see pushing the limits, which we do, and you see customers in there, and certainly technology. So how do we get connected with customers? We work at this in a very significant way. We have very deep ties to our businesses. We're not a research center that's off to the side doing its own thing. We are very meaningfully connected to our businesses. And the way I think about our success measure, it's measured by the success of these businesses in the way they serve their customers and the market share that they earn, and certainly in their profitability. We have lots of interactions with customers. Our global centers are built to be customer facing. In any center at any, any day of the week, you would see customers coming in, visiting, learning from us, we learning from them, deeply engaged. We have deep marketing connections. We run thing called, things called session T's for technology, where we bring in customers, business teams, and marketing teams, and certainly technology teams, and they tell us what their vision for the future looks like, and we work with them to enable that vision. We're deeply connected to technical communities, and we work very hard at reaching out to sources of innovation all around the world. As I mentioned, we're deeply tied to our businesses. The core of that is that our funding mainly comes from the businesses. You can see over half of the funding comes directly from the businesses. There's no corporate mandate that says that they must spend money with us. They do it because they get value. Our connections with them are very intimate and profound as we shape the futures of their industry. We get external funding, principally from the US government, from, from, but from other big companies and governments around the world, as I'll show you. And then we have a pool of corporate funding that we use to, to fund technology developments and innovation ahead of the risk appetite or time horizon of our businesses, but always, always, always with the idea of driving benefits to our businesses. We talk about the GE store, and the G idea of the GE store is that each business can contribute to the GE store, and each business can take from the GE store. And the GE Global Research Network is exactly the GE store for technology. We invest in foundational things like basic material sciences and thrusts like high-performance computing and do the basic work to, to the advantage of all the businesses. And we spread ideas from one business to another. We might develop advanced technologies like ceramic matrix composites, which I'll talk about in a minute, drive it to our aviation business first and then spread it over time into our power business and into our oil and gas business. We look for value in acquisitions. We acquire businesses that have something that we don't, or quite often, businesses where we can add value from our technology store into what they do. And we do nurture innovations. These things are all brand new businesses that we've built up inside the research team and now are spreading out. And they're taking their own life and, and spreading their wings and growing. And we drive things at scale. You hear GE talk about itself as a digital industrial company. This is a thrust built out of our research center, now taking its own form and driving across the company. And if you watch the NFL, as I do watching Tom Brady, you will see these ads about young people coming out with their degrees in computer science and, 
and software and coming to work with us to take that skill and complement our existing skills in machinery and deep domain knowledge. And then as I will show you, we work hard to build an engineering community that shares ideas and practices and makes the company better across its businesses. These are the ways that we drive innovation. We connect up with big companies and universities and so on. I'm going to walk you through some examples of each of these. So big companies. Here's a, is a small list of many companies that we work with. These are all big names that you would have heard about. We're very proud of the fact that GE won a Boeing Supplier of the Year Award, not for the aircraft engines that we provide them, but for the research that we did to enable them to move their technologies forward. We work with a pharmaceutical company like Eli Lilly to develop advanced technologies and diagnostic tools, and on and on across the board. It's a very natural thing for us to work big company to big company. We have many connections with universities. The Technical University of Munich is a good example. Our research center in Germany is right on the edge of the campus of the Technical University, and therefore our connection is quite deep. Students come and work with us quite often. We share facilities with the university and so on across the board. And we have literally hundreds of connections with universities around the world. They are very typically researcher to researcher, people who know each other well and collaborate to do great things in technology and innovation. As I mentioned, we do work with governments, principally the US government. We work with the different agencies there to do really very, very innovative things. And we can increasingly engage with governments around the world, the European Union governments certainly, but increasingly the governments of China and India to advance their agenda and our agenda along the same lines. We do what we call in-country, for-country innovation. And here's an example out of our healthcare business. What we've learned is that each country will have a different set of needs. China, for instance, and India, developing countries, need very low-cost solutions to meet the healthcare needs of their businesses. So, China, for instance, has urban hospitals that are very much like you'd see in sophisticated cities in the United States. But their rural hospitals are much, much different. They're very rudimentary and they need very, very low cost solutions. So we put our local teams to work driving innovation, understanding the customer needs, and working directly with the customers to develop these innovations. Here we have examples of CT scanners that are very low cost. They might have things like a table that you'd have motorized in the United States to move the patient around. Might be done by an individual in China or India. You might have a CT scanner that uses what we call fewer slices. Might take a little more time, but would get a very crisp image nonetheless. So a very high quality, but done at a low cost. We drive the innovation there, and then we take it out to the rest of the world, even the developed countries. We do calls for open collaborations. We put out a call for an idea that the thing on the left-hand side was a challenge we put out to anybody in the world to use 3D printing to develop a component, a bracket that, su that supports pieces on an aircraft engine. The winner of this was a young person in Southeast Asia who had limited technical training but had taught himself some great things, had some very clever ideas, and won our challenge. We do things like that that are relatively simple, all the way up to challenges for breast, care solutions, breast cancer solutions, where you need very sophisticated technologies and hospitals and, and people who are very steeped in those things to solve those problems. But the idea is that we stretch outside the company, we provide people with access to our needs, and we reward them financially and otherwise for the solutions that they provide. We have a venture capital arm as well. We started this maybe seven years ago in the energy space with the idea that we could make a profit from our investments, but more important from my perspective as a leader of technology for the company is that we would learn about what was going on in the startup world, the world that we didn't see very clearly from our traditional perspective. That worked very well for us, and we've built out now practices in healthcare, in software, and advanced manufacturing. This is a wonderful way for us to invest, learn, and profit all at the same time. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we think about our technology team. We've done a number of things to contemporize our, our thinking about the way we do technology. I've led an engineering leaders council. These are the leaders of the technology teams in each of the GE businesses. And we've gone from just being a collegial best practice sharing group to a group focused on strong initiatives to move the company forward, and I'll show you what those are. 
The Edison program is our entry level program. We get young people from great schools with great credentials. We're contemporizing this, giving them skills that really help them go to the next level of performance. And we're doing things to build leadership. We've had traditional leadership programs in the company, not the least of which is the GE corporate audit staff, where people have rotating financial assignments and get to know the businesses. Many of the company leaders have come from that program. We've created a parallel to that in the technology side. And the idea here is that we want the future leaders of the company to be coming from the technology side. Jeff Immelt, our CEO, jokes, but it's not really a joke, that when he goes to Silicon Valley, the finance people are in the back room while the technology people are running the companies. And that's what we want more of in the future of GE. This is what we did, what we call Technology 2025. And this was the idea of getting the technology leaders and business leaders from around the company together to think about what we wanted our technology team to look like in the future. We did a lot of internal interviews and we did a number of external interviews with great global companies to get their ideas about the best thinking of what's needed for the future. We took some time off site, external speakers come in, talk to us about contemporary trends, and out of that came five priorities for our Engineering Leaders Council. There they are on the right-hand side, and I'm going to walk you quickly through what those are. The first one was the idea of a digital thread. And this is the idea of transitioning from a, an enterprise that runs on paper drawings, which we still do in many cases, to an enterprise that's run completely in the digital world. So designs created with the most sophisticated digital techniques, no longer paper drawings, but three-dimensional digital drawings, pass through our factories and on into our field, all the way through the service over the lifetime of the equipment. So we know everything about every piece of equipment that we make through its entire lifetime. Another is the idea of driving platforms that all the GE businesses can use. This is the idea that instead of each business doing its own thing, which we all do all too often, that we would do things across the company for the benefit of all. I'll talk to you in a bit about the idea of a software platform we call Predix, but that's one idea of a platform that all the businesses they can, can use. We've gone to con common control systems that will be used in things like power generation turbines to oil and gas drivers to transportation systems and wind turbines and on and on across the company, and even ideas like system on a chip that can have benefits for across our company. We're building a collaboration network that can enable our scientists, research, and innovators to understand what's gone on before and not have to recreate the experiments and analysis that have gone into discovery. That they can take the best benefit from people who have done this work across the company. So we're building that network as we speak. And we're driving for what we think of as the engineer of the future. This is the idea that yes, we'll have to have domain expertise in things like the healthcare business that we work in or the aviation business that we work in. But aside from the narrow technical depth that we'll have to have, we'll have to have the ability to think about the way the whole system comes together in a more effective way than we do now. And while many of our people are hardware-oriented today, we want them to be software-oriented as well in the future. So we have very definite actions in place to give those people the skills that they need, and not only the young people who are coming up, but the leaders who need to adapt and learn for the future. And here's something we call FastWorks. This is the idea of driving speed into everything we do, particularly in the realm of new product introduction. We got to this in a very interesting way. We were struggling with speed, and our CEO was pushing us like heck on some of our new product introduction. So Beth Comstock, who is our vice chairman now and head of marketing, introduced me to a young fellow named Eric Reese. Eric is a guy from Silicon Valley. He's literally about half of my age. And he came into a room full of people like me. And I remember looking at young Eric and thinking, what the heck is this young dude going to tell guys like me who have been through lots and lots of learnings over our, over our careers, what's he going to tell us about innovation? But I got to tell you, Eric was fantastic. He's the author of a book called Lean Startup. And he brought ideas to us that have changed the way we think and have driven real speed into the company. And these are the ideas the lead startup now applied to GE. First, the idea is you have a big problem you want to solve. You identify your leap of faith assumptions. You do what are called MVPs or minimum viable products. And you get them out into the marketplace as fast as you can go 
to get learnings back from your customers. You have certain metrics that you watch, and this is not just revenue and profitability, but it's clicking off responses to the things that you want to know about what your leaf of faith assumption is telling you. And then you change. And one thing I've learned about innovation is it is never a straight line. Things never go exactly the way we want, so we have to learn and adapt as we go. This framework has helped us to do this in a much more clear-eyed way, has helped us to think about this across our company in a very significantly different way and to drive speed and, I think, time to market in a much more effective way. I want to close by punching through some of the things that we work on to give you an idea of why I'm so excited about the future for technology and innovation and NGE as well. These are six simple ways we think about think buckets of things we do, from extreme machines to super materials to the map mind and healthcare to brilliant factories, energy everywhere, and the industrial internet. So extreme machines, these range from things like the LEAP engine, which is the most sophisticated jet engine in the world. It's our brand new engine that will begin flying next year. It's got every element of technology that a technologist could ever want to have in it. It's got advanced materials, sophisticated control systems, high performance computing used to build it up, advanced thermodynamics, everything you could think of, a technologist's dream. The H-turbine is the land-based power generation equivalent of that. It's the biggest, most efficient machine in the world. The Evolution locomotive is singular, and that is the only locomotive today that can meet the emissions requirements required by the US EPA. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about subsea factories. So these are very big, difficult, challenging, high technology things that we do that push the limits of performance across the board. They require things like super materials. Here's an example of a super material that we invented because we needed it. These are ceramic matrix composites. These are silicon carbide fibers that are the diameter of a human hair or less with special coatings on them to enable them to survive inside a matrix of a differently constructed silicon carbide material. And you can see from the charts there that these have performance characteristics that are far superior to the existing alloys that they replace. And they allow us to go to higher temperatures with less cooling air. We can go to 500 degrees more temperature, which is quite significant. They weigh one-third the weight of the metals that they replace. And that amounts to 1.5% fuel efficiency gain on an aircraft engine. Now, you may say that's not very much. But that, over the lifetime of an aircraft engine, is worth hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars worth of value to our customers. And that difference is enable us to, uh, us to win 75% of the existing new orders for aircraft engines. We've built a great, great franchise built on this kind of world-leading technology. We are the only supplier in the world who can do this today. Here's a different look at healthcare. We have tools to look at the mind in, at different scales. We can extract tissue from brains to look at what's going on with disease states. And we have technologies around molecular pathology that allow us to see the development of these disease states in ways that nobody can else do because we can quantify actions of multiple proteins and therefore the genes that are making the proteins work in a way that nobody else can do. We can use advanced magnetic resonance imaging to look at this, well, the structures of brains and see what's going on and using functional magnetic resonance imaging actually see the way your brain works when you're thinking about things. And we even have some very new tools using some very fine probes to insert them inside a, a patient's brain, maybe an epilepsy patient. And we can actually see what's going on to trigger epilepsy pulses or many other activities inside a brain. So this is opening the door to whole new fields of study around the brain works. Here's a different thing. I mentioned CAT scanning before. This is the most advanced CAT scanning platform in the world. It's called the Revolution CT. And it is enabling us to see the heart in a way that couldn't be seen before. You can imagine that capturing an image of a beating heart is the most difficult application for any of these imaging modalities because your heart is always moving. And today, in order to get a good image, they often have to slow your heartbeat down, which is not something you want to do with a person who's under physical stress anyway. But these things move so fast, and the imaging post-processing is so good that we can actually see the structure, and not only the structure of the heart, but see what tissues might have been impacted by whatever disease is going on in the patient's heart. And we're very close, I think, to being able to eliminate 
interventional procedures where you have to go up through a patient's leg up into the heart in an invasive way that's scary and somewhat dangerous. So tremendous advances here with great technology. And here's a different thing we call 4D ultrasound. So 4D is for four dimensions. You have the three physical dimensions, X, Y, Z, and then you have time as well. So what we can do is capture really the motion of a heart here. This is a transesophageal probe. It doesn't sound very, very attractive, but instead of having to make some very difficult invasive look at what's going on, you can put this probe down a patient's throat during surgery and get brilliant images of what's going on in the heart, and that enables really effective quick surgery. Here's a different space. This is the oil and gas space. You all know that the price of oil has come down. The industry is under stress. But I believe we're going to need these resources for many, many years to come. There are many oil and gas resources in the world. They are in increasingly difficult places to get, and that requires lots of technology. Here's uh, something we call FLNG floating liquefied natural gas platform. We're the only ones in the world who can do this advanced technology. It requires advanced compressors, uh, connectivity to, to pull up the resource from the ocean floor, and highly reliable things that can operate in extreme environments. And here is a component that's called a blowout preventer. You probably remember what happened in the Gulf with BP's incident not too many years ago. It was one of these that failed that started the whole process. It was not a GE blowout preventer. So we have upgraded the technology, put many more safety features in there, and this 20,000 PSI just references the capability to handle pressures coming up for the oil and gas that comes out that's way higher than anybody else could do before. These are extreme machines at the maximum. You want this to go down there and act reliably for many, many years. This is the kind of stuff that we think GE can do that nobody else can do in a very safe, reliable way. And this requires the GE store that I mentioned to you before. We capture things from our software center that go for the monitoring and diagnostics of this. We take material science from our aircraft engine business, put it in here. Many things for sophisticated techniques come from our healthcare business to enable us to monitor what's going on with these flows. All of the company's resources come to play in making these complicated systems work. Here's a very different thing. Here's renewables. The chart on the left shows you the progress we've made using advanced technology to drive down the cost of electricity coming from wind turbines. I was telling Dean Munson earlier that we bought Enron's wind turbine business out of bankruptcy. It was a $200 million business. It was losing money. We poured a lot of technology into it. We put a lot of operational know-how into delivering these effectively. And we've built this by dropping the cost of electricity down, as you can see, from 15 cents a kilowatt hour to just about 5 cents, to the point where it's pretty close to being competitive on its own with fossil power. And now we've got a $6.5 billion business that is beautifully profitable. And this was the best acquisition that the company ever made. And what happened here was we put a lot of technologies of very sophisticated materials, structural systems, and even control systems that allow us to adapt the movement of the blades to deal with oncoming wind to enable us to get the most out of these machines. Very exciting, and there's a lot more room to go. Uh, you're thinking about entrepreneurship. Here's an internal startup, and we have quite a few of these. Here we are cutting the ribbon in our new factory. We started this idea for solid oxide fuel cells in the research center. We worked with the Department of Energy for, of Energy for a number of years. We, in fact, backed down a large program we had to give us the time to develop the basics to do this right. We got an incredible breakthrough. We think we have a cost position that is one-third of the cost level of the nearest competitor, and we're building a business as fast as we can go. You see, uh, maybe it's not so easy to see, but the woman cutting the ribbon is Johanna Wellington. We took her and her team out of the research center, moved them physically to a new location, took a team of 20 or 30 people, and they are building this business on their own. It's very exciting. We're ramping up this up as fast as we can go. There's incredible customer demand, so as soon as we can get our factory ramped up, we're going to have a really great business here. The idea of this is when you put this solid oxide fuel cell system together with a small gas turbine or reciprocating engine, you can get locally generated power that's 65% efficient. Now, to give you some context, the most efficient central plants are maybe 62% efficient. So here's the idea, local power more efficient than central power, a complete inversion of the 100-year-old paradigm. I mentioned this transportation evolution series, uh, Tier 4 locomotive. Tier 4 is an EPA restriction on emissions. We had to cut the emissions down from these locomotives 
by over 70%. We invested in a tough time in the industry. We're the only ones who have the technology to do this. Our competitors can't. We're getting lots and lots of orders from US customers who need these things now. It's a beautiful place to, to be in a business, and it's driven by innovation. This is a little different thing. This is Rail 360, Con Rail Connect 360. This is the idea of using software solutions across our transportation business to enable the locomotives to operate more effectively. We've got like an autopilot on the engine so that the engineer doesn't have to control it so, so finally anymore they know what the train has to go through. That by itself is a 10% fuel efficiency gain. And to get that in the engine itself would require hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. So it's a beautiful thing here. And we're doing this for a thing we call movement planner, which does the whole system of trains, and the yard planner, which does system of trains inside a, a rail yard as well. Big efficiency gains for our customers. Here's the idea of G's Brilliant Factory. And the simple idea here is that we want to put sensors on every machine in our factories. We want to connect them all up. We want to know everything about every part we make so we can continuously improve our process. We want to carry that knowledge from the design phase right through the factory, right through the install base. And that gives us power of knowledge and ability to move this forward like nobody else will have. And finally, there's the industrial internet. This is the idea of taking all the power of software and big data and analytics and applying it to the industrial world. We're not in the Facebook clicks. We're not into watching commercial stuff going down. We're into using in the power of this software to drive industrial know-how. And we believe that the power of the data and analytics, coupled with our deep domain knowledge, can enable us to serve our customers in a way that nobody else can do. A platform that we've built is called Predix. This is a software platform that's designed for exactly this kind of application. It enables anyone inside GE or even people outside of GE to build applications that deal with complicated assets and able you to monitor, diagnose, analyze, and improve any set of equipment. I hope and I trust that many of you will one day program on Predix. So there's a quick breeze through a set of innovation that's going on in our company, and it's a reflection of what's going on in the world. And the idea here is that we have a central research organization pushing the limits of technology and feeding it into every one of these great GE businesses and making the world a better place in the process. So that's my story. Dean Munson, if you can come up, we can happy to take any questions you might have. That's kind of stupid, yeah. really. Okay, so we'll have a seat out here on the stage for just a, a few minutes. Uh, Mark, thanks a lot for a fascinating and very quick tour of uh, GE technology. So um, I guess I would have expected all these great things coming out of GE. I might not have expected to hear the word entrepreneurship and innovation so many times, even Silicon Valley. Uh, and I, and I understand the processes you're putting in place to foster innovation, as you described, but suppose you're a, an engineer or somebody else working at GE at some lower level mm -hmm. in the company, and you've got some big idea. How do you make entrepreneurship happen at that level within such a big company? Yeah, so we have processes for soliciting ideas from all of our people. We want them from all the people in the research team and the people in the businesses team. So we, we have a, an annual process for looking at those ideas and deciding which ones we'll fund and which ones we, we won't fund. And the good news is we have more ideas than we can fund. So we say yes to some important things, but we say no to others. And what we've seen sometimes is that when we say no, people don't give up, they come back and they keep pushing and then ultimately they'll win, the idea will mature and it will go on to something else. And those things we fund, and the beauty of having a research center is we can fund a lot of ideas at low levels and see what develops over time. And then the ones that we have some strength to, we can build a team around that and push that. We're using this very idea of FastWorks to fund these things. And we're seeing people build up nice new businesses around some of these ideas. So there is entrepreneurship alive and well, even in a big company. In a big company. Yeah. I should ask, are there questions out in the audience? This, this is a group that's used to asking questions. And with Please. the lights, I'm having a little, little trouble seeing. But, Anybody want to raise a hand and ask a question? Please do. I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Yeah. So I was just wondering if we could hear a little bit more about
that personally, I'm good, yeah. So you want, want me to tell you my story? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great question. Okay. Yeah. What happened? How did you get yeah, where you Yeah, so are? it's sort of interesting. So I joined GE with a master's degree from Northeastern, as Dean Munson had told you. And my idea was I would go get a PhD and become a researcher or an academic or something like that. That was what was in my mind. But I wanted to get some industrial research first. So I joined GE because I could get the industrial experience. And there were world-class people in the area that I wanted to get my PhD in, which was fracture mechanics. And so I got the, the beautiful situation of having the industrial experience and getting connected up with some work that they were doing. And it turned out that a fellow named Fong Shi, who ultimately became the president of the National University of Singapore mm -hmm. and the head of mm -hmm. King Abdul University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, was, a, was my friend from the research center, and he got on my thesis committee. I went and took some time and did that full time at RPI, and then I had a tough decision to make, whether I wanted to go into the research area that I had aimed at in the first place or go back to the industrial side. And what happened for me was that I chose to go back to the industrial side because along the way of getting that industrial experience, I fell in love with the breadth and depth of opportunity that a company like GE could offer. And so I went back into the business with the idea that I would grow my breadth and grow a, a career that's more toward diversity than the narrow focus and rich depth of a, a research career. And what happened was beyond my expectations. I, I, was a, I grew up, I told you I was a Boston sports fan. I grew up in the city of Boston. I grew up actually in the city, a place called Dorchester. If any of you guys know the place, it's not, the, it's not an upscale place. It's a rough and tumble kind of place. And so for me to end up as the CTO of a company like GE was a path beyond my career, beyond any expectations I ever had. I worked as a working level engineer. I got a first level management job. I got to run a program for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency for a while. And then I got an opportunity to post for a job that I never thought I would get running a $400 million profit and loss center back in 1989. Mm -hmm. So I went to Schenectady, I did that, that worked well. I got to run what we call business development for our power business, so I did mergers and acquisitions, strategic planning. Then I got to run another $2 billion P&L. Then I got to run, run engineering for the power business. And then I got to run for eight years the power generation business. And for me, this was a really exciting thing. It was a, it was a large profit and loss center. It was actually losing money and we took it from losing a couple hundred million dollars a year to earning four billion dollars of operating profit in its peak year, which was a run beyond anything ever happened in the company ever. So I did that and then 10 years ago I went to the research center and I've had a diversity of experiences and 10 years I couldn't have told you half the stories or a tenth of the stories I just told you and now I can. So there's a kid from the streets of Boston going up through a big company like GE and having a diversity of experiences that were way beyond anything I ever dreamed of. And it's been just an absolutely fabulous place for me to be. And what I'd ask you, all of you to think about in your own lives is that you don't know what's ahead of you. You can't know. Focus on something that's meaningful to you. One piece of advice I'd like to give you is build some domain expertise to start with. Build something that is your core. I see young people make a mistake sometimes, and they're bright, they're energetic, but they scatter themselves around and don't build any depth in anything. And before anybody will take a chance on you inside a big company or even as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to show that you can actually do something. And so do something and then branch out from there, as opposed to trying to branch out and never having done anything. So that's my story and that's my advice. Yeah, great. Are there other questions? Right here. Okay, so the, for those that couldn't hear, the question is about motivation. Have the things that motivate Mark changed during his career? Not much. So I like to think of myself as a very curious person. So I like to learn about new things. That's why being in the research center is such an exciting thing because of the variety of things that you're engaged in and deeply with extremely start smart people is very exciting to me. So. I like that and I've always had a focus of learning and growing as I went along. And the thing about GE too, GE is sort of, I think of GE as like a working class, hard working company. Everybody comes to work early, they work like hell, that's kind of been me and that's, that's been that way my whole life. You know, we we're, were joking last night, if you go to a GE executive meeting, everybody shows up early. Nobody shows up, 
everybody shows up early. It just gives you an indication of the way the company is. I think that's who I am too, and that's why I like the place so much. Gee, Mark, it sounds like you're saying you can't be a student forever. <laughs> you've got to be early. Okay. I saw some other hands. Is there... There's a fellow right here. In the okay. Floor. Okay. This one's uh, more of on the GE scale. What's a field that GE really hasn't touched yet that you're looking to go into and you're excited to go into? So uh, I, I touched on it a little bit. The software thing that I mentioned is a really big new initiative for us. I think it's, it's uh, boundless in its opportunities. We're not going to be a Google, Google. We're not going to be an Apple. We're an industrial company who knows industrial spaces. And we're going to take the power of software and big data and analytics and build that out. It's very much complementary to what we're doing, but it opens up some new spaces for us. That platform I called Predicts, that I mentioned to you there, that's a platform that's built for our internal use, but our dream is that other people will use this to build their industrial applications. So we see that very much as a platform that can do other things beyond GE's kind of core businesses. So wait and see what happens with that. That could be very interesting to us. Is there one last question? Many students over here uh, would want to be entrepreneurs at an early stage, and it is always suggested to get uh, at least two to three years of uh, work experience in an industry before uh, starting your own company in an established industry. So what kind of positions should, uh, should students apply for in that particular industry? Like, Should they apply for technical positions or something related to systems engineering or product development? Or, uh, so just to translate what I think I heard, I, I think you're asking what kinds of positions would a young person want to use to get a foundation to build up the ability to do other things? That, that's the idea? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is what do you really like to do? And you've got to go with your heart on these things. And you know, that, that is a really fundamentally important thing, I think. Find something that you really like to do and build on that. And as I said, develop domain expertise and depth on it. There, there are many great spaces. The software space is explosive, that's true. Things like robotics are very interesting. You know. But any core domain that you can learn and build an expertise and build a reputation for yourself inside a big company, though, that sort of thing will serve you very, very well. Well, let's thank Mark Little for his excellent comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you very much. You can have a seat down there. Okay. Okay. And we've got to do one more thing here before we adjourn to our reception. I'd like to offer an opportunity for Jim Meller to come forward and make remarks. Jim is a highly distinguished alumnus. He's a valued advisor and significant supporter of the University of Michigan and the College of Engineering. Jim was raised in Detroit. He earned his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and mathematics, and then a master's degree in electrical engineering. I'd mentioned before that was in 1952 and 1954, respectively. His long and distinguished career culminated in service as chairman and CEO of General Dynamics. He's received many national awards and honors, for a decade, Jim was a member of the College of Engineering's National Advisory Committee. He and Suzanne's tremendous support of Michigan Engineering has included making uh, or arranging many gifts, including today's lectureship. I'd ask that Jim please come forward and offer some brief remarks. Thank you, Dave, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm always pleased to return to Ann Arbor, spend some good face-to-face -face time with, with the dean and uh, with uh, uh, other faculty members relative to the weather. I, uh, it, it does not grab me. Uh, and thank you, Mark, for uh, a really stimulating talk on innovation. And I thought this discussion here was, uh, was right on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the talk by Mark this morning is what the Mellor Lecture is all about. Over the last several years since embarking on this lecture series, uh, we've heard from a politician, if you can believe it, uh, several chairmen and CEOs from some of our more technologically and very successful companies, entrepreneurs, educators, a venture capitalist, and today a 
gentleman uh, involved in global research with a focus on innovation. The common thread, ladies and gentlemen, is that all of these speakers were engineering graduates. And the bottom line is that in engineering education, the education that you're now presently receiving opened so many doors to you, doors that you w couldn't even recognize today. The analytical training that you receive provides you with the knowledge and the mindset to solve all kinds of business problems and leadership challenges. And uh, as I've indicated, it's invaluable in many fields. Sure, after graduation, uh, most of you will probably be involved in a technical discipline, much like Mark, and have a great and rewarding career. When I left the university, like Mark, all I wanted to be was the best engineer that I could be. I didn't even know what a chairman of a company or a CEO or a COO was, was really all about. And I started on that path with several patents, numerous published technical papers and, and so forth. But somehow I got uh, diverted. Perhaps some good advice from close friends, mentors, uh, what have you. And as Dave has indicated, eventually I became the chairman of one of the most successful aerospace defense companies in our country. It gave me opportunities I had never dreamed about. Financial rewards, meeting world leaders and newsmakers, visiting countries, all beyond my wildest uh, expectations. This lecture series is intended to make you aware of a a broader world and help you prepare for it. And recognize that your education here at Michigan Engineering well positions you to address a wide range of these opportunities. And I think uh, Mark uh, well exemplifies that. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks very much, Jim. I think Jim emphasizes that if you're a student here, boy, you are really at the very, very beginning and you can't imagine uh, what your future may be and that has to be tremendously exciting. Well, thanks once again to Jim Meller for making this lecture possible and to Mark Little for delivering an, exec uh, an excellent set of, of uh, comments, especially in the responses to our students. We're going to adjourn now to reception, and uh, Mark Little will be around for a while if you'd like to come up and speak with him. Thank you. I was one of, you know, four or five people in all of Ann Arbor that knew anything about mobile applications, right? And this is just like a year or two off the iPhone or Android. Uh, I ended up getting introduced to a guy named Ben Cazez, who was not a U of M guy.